Thank you very much, Matt. That was very kind. Um, so for the next half hour before the break, I'm just going to talk about something uh, a little bit uh, different. Um, and I guess these are my disclosures, but my main disclosure, I think, is, uh, I guess, academic reputational in that um, I led the invention of most of what I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, half hour or so. So just take a step back and think, how do you cut tissue inside the heart? Um, and traditionally, I'd go to Matt, and, uh, and he would put the patient under GA, crack the chest open, freeze the heart, clamp the aorta, and then either cut the aorta or the left atrium and get inside, find what he needs to cut, cut it, and then reverse all of that. So that is how uh, we cut tissue inside the heart until quite recently. So imagine if you could cut tissue inside the heart while the patient was awake and talking to you. And after you cut tissue inside the heart, they said thank you and left without any pain. And you can do this with transcatheter electrosurgery, just using two catheters from the groin and an electrified wire. And this is a procedure here called lampoon, where I use an electrified wire between two catheters to cut the anterior mitral valve leaflet that you can do um, in about half an hour and that splits the anterior mitral valve leaflet straight down the center, and this enables transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Um, which, and if in this patient, in this animation, if you perform transcatheter mitral valve replacement, that anterior leaflet would obstruct the flow of blood in the heart. Whereas after the lampoon procedure, which mimics what Matt can do in surgery, resecting the anterior leaflet and preserving the cords, um, you know, this patient has a clean, uh, left, an open left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So there is a clear need for transcatheter uh, tissue modification. And I'm just going to deal with the top line over here. Uh, so five areas of clinical need and five procedures using transcatheter electrosurgery. So let's deal with transcaval access first. Uh, you saw from the TVT data that about 5% of patients require non-femoral alternative access. Transcaval access is the only one of those alternative accesses that is ergonomic. So no one else in the cath lab has to do anything different. Everyone stands at the legs. Only the first operator does something different. The rest of the team don't even know that anything different is happening. It's fully percutaneous. So there are two that are fully percutaneous, auxiliary and, and, uh, and transcaval. And this can be done under local anesthesia and moderate sedation. Uh, you don't require GA, you don't have to stand at the head, flip the room around, or any of those other things. And crucially, the key, the main form of alternative access, about 70%, I think I'm right in saying, Dave, is subclavian or, or transaxillary. And there are numerous studies now, including a large cohort of patients from the TVT registry, showing that the stroke rate for subclavian and transax is between 6 to 7%. So individual centers can't turn around and say, well, our hospital stroke rate is not that because, you know, th th this, is a, this is a rare occurrence and you have several publications now with large amounts of data showing that there is this increased stroke rate. So, which, which you don't see with transcarotid and you don't see with transcaval. So I think this really is a great opportunity for alternative access. And I'll just show you what this looks like. This is transcaval access. There's just two eight French sheets in the groin, no surgical cut down, operators standing at the leg. So on the left, you have access to the vein, on the right, you have the artery, and that's what you use. You use the electrosurgery pencil, you push the yellow button, and that's about all the equipment you need. You see in the fluoroscopy, electrify a wire across from the IVC into the aorta, where there's a snare waiting, you then snare that wire and send it up, and you upsize that wire essentially to a stiff Lundequist wire, which you see now. And over the Lundequist wire, uh, you put the large sheath in. This could be a large sheath for Tava. It could also be a sheath for Impeller. Uh, it could be a sheath for 5.0 Impeller if you need, which gives you percutaneous access. And that's it. That's transcaval access done. Um, now you proceed with Tava. 
uh, which again, you don't need to do anything special. You don't have to stand at the head, you don't have to stand at the arm. You know, everyone stands where they're used to standing, deploy the valve uh, from the legs. And then once you deploy the valve, again, the sequence is, is pretty similar. You take your root shot. If, you're every, if, you're, if everything's happy, you then exit the valve. And over there, you see you close the hole that you make between the aorta and the IVC uh, with an Amplatz duct occluder. Again, something that most interventionists are now familiar with. Instead of closing holes in the heart, we now, we now use that to close um, the aorta. So that's, that's problem number one, which is alternative access. Problem number two, TAVA-related coronary obstruction. It still happens in about 1% of cases. It happens more frequently in valve and valve, up to 2 to 6%, depending on the type of biprosthetic valve. And in TAV and TAV, CT simulations suggest it happens in around, would happen in around 20% of cases. So really crucial for the lifetime management of, of aortic valve disease. And when it happens, it's deadly. 40 to 50% 30-day mortality, despite attempted rescue with PCI or bypass. And crucially, you can predict it and it's preventable. The most obvious way to prevent it is not perform TAVA, perform surgery. Um, there is a palliative way of prevention, which is called snorkel stenting. And the reason I call it palliative is because it, you know, you have no, no longer have access to the coronary arteries after you do, you do a snorkel stent and you've got a sort of crushed, under-expanded stent in the left main. Uh, so what if the patient is not a surgical candidate? There's a procedure called basilica, again uses transcatheter electrosurgery, where you put two catheters either side of the leaflet that's going to obstruct the coronary artery, electrify that wire through the base of the valve, and electrify the wire again as you pull it up. And that leaflet splits and splays away from the coronary artery. So now when you perform TAVA, that maintains flow into the coronary artery, uh, which if you hadn't split it, it would have otherwise obstructed. And there's good data to show that Basilica is both safe and effective. This is, an, uh, this is the uh, NIH-led IDE uh, study for Basilica in um, 30 patients, which showed that Basilica was essentially successful in 93%. There's 100% survival and freedom from coronary obstruction. Uh, there was a small signal in these patients that there might be an increased stroke risk, but uh, this was only 30 patients, and only one of those strokes was embolic. And crucially, at one year, there were no late complications from Basilica. So we decided we needed more data on the stroke risk, so collect collected more data from a larger registry in 214 patients. The really important thing is the bottom line here. So at 30 days, you've taken these patients, by the way, who are pre-selected to be incredibly high risk. So you can predict on CT who's going to obstruct, and these patients have a 40 to 50% inpatient mortality, and you've taken those patients to be exactly what every other patient is during TAVA, mortality around 2.8%, stroke around 2.8%, disabling stroke around 0.5% more or less matches the TVT data. So I think this is a great achievement, great advance for those patients who are at risk of coronary obstruction. Okay. Problem number three. This is a big one. TMVR-related LVOT obstruction. LVOT obstruction is the leading cause of screen failure for TMVR. For dead, you know, th this is a big thing that's holding the field back. For all, uh, if you pool the data for, uh, in the U.S. for clinical trials, 70 to 90 percent of patients screen fail from TMV TMVR devices. And so LVOT obstruction, you can see from the cartoon, when you put a valve in the mitral position, it pushes that anterior leaflet over to the septum and blocks the outflow tract. So this is common, deadly, predictable, precludes treatment, and crucially, it is preventable with a procedure called Lampoon, which is the animation I, I showed you. Lampoon mimics the surgical standard, which is resection of the anterior leaflet, preservation of the cords. That leaflet splits and splays after splitting because that cord, the cords pull the leaflet away from the LVOT, 
And furthermore, when you deploy the valve, that's that it, the leaflet splays even further. And if you see from the 3D echo image, what's really nice about a nice clean linear laceration is you don't have torrential MR. And so you have time then to deploy the valve because you see the leaflet co-opting in systole. Um, and and so, so you can go ahead and deploy the TMVR valve in a reasonably relaxed manner. And again, there's good data um, for the safety and efficacy of this uh, in an NIH uh, FDA IDE trial, um, which showed that Lampoon was successful in 100% of patients. 97% had no LVOT obstruction, zero stroke. And if, let's put this in context on the graph on the right. In patients who have LVOT obstruction, 30-day survival is 38%. If you do this surgically or in a hybrid surgical manner, you know, because many of these patients weren't surgical candidates because of heavy MAC, if you do a transatrial and deploy and resect the leaflet and deploy the valve, 30-day survival was 73%. But if you take away the surgical comorbidity and do this percutaneously with Lampoon, survival improves to 93%. So again, uh, a real advance for these patients. And I'll show you uh, a brief case, and, uh, and this might uh, whet your appetite for what's going to happen in about an hour live. So um, we have, this is a patient with uh, severe mitral annular calcification, no good surgical options, as you can see from, from, from that calcium. And uh, let me just go back back. And the, what we can do on CT is simulate a valve and then measure the area in the left ventricular outflow tract. And anything less than 200 puts you at risk of outflow tract obstruction. And this patient, that area measured there is 130. And so we went ahead and performed lampoon. And this is an entirely percutaneous procedure using two deflectable catheters uh, across the interatrial septum in the left atrium. One houses a snare and the other houses a guide wire which you use to electrify a wire through the center of the anterior leaflet. Once you form that wire loop on the left, you just electrify that wire and gradually pull and no, uh, you, you saw a complete bar of anterior calcium on the anterior leaflet. You can cut through all of that if you're patient and you use the electricity to do the work. And that splits the anterior leaflet straight down the center. And the image on the right is really nice. You can see that the valve is extending all the way down to the septum. If the anterior leaflet was in track, that would have blocked the flow of blood going from the LV out into the aorta. But because we've created a channel by splitting the anterior leaflet, there's zero LVOT gradient there. Problem number four, for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, one of the major issues is the lifetime management of those patients. So if you insert a clip or a Pascal device, there is no uh, the, the current thinking is that you then can't perform transcatheter mitral valve replacement because you've put those clip devices in place. Well, this is no longer the case because if you cut the attachment onto the anterior leaflet, as you can see in that green dotted line in the, in the, uh, in the cartoon there, you can detach the clip from the anterior leaflet and recreate a single orifice to uh, allow transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Uh, and we studied this in uh, a small cohort of, uh, of five patients uh, using uh, the, uh, the tendine valve um, after clip detachment. Uh, and it was successful in all five cases. And I'll just briefly show you how it's done. Again, using two deflectable sheets from the septum, you go into each of the two orifices uh, created after edge-to-edge -edge repair. After creating a wire loop, you electrify and pull back. And there you go. Those two clips that were attached to both anterior and posterior leaflets are now only attached to the posterior leaflet, creating a single orifice, allowing for uh, easy valve deployment, full valve expansion, and no paravalvular leak. Final problem, problem number five, is septal reduction therapy. This is a 
problem for two cohorts of patients. Number one, for patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And number two, again, in patients who need transcatheter mitral valve replacement who are at risk of outflow tract obstruction. What are the options these patients have? Well, myectomy is considered the gold standard. But I would put to you, it's probably the gold standard in about four centers in the world that they do this enough. Um, and that's where most of the data is driven from. If you look at the national inpatient sample, the inpatient mortality for this is 5%, which is staggeringly high for these patients. Pacemaker rate of 10% and stroke at 2%. What about alcohol septal ablation? Well, the pacemaker rate for that is 12%. It's up to 20% if you're a woman. Um, and crucially, uh, the, there is a mismatch between the coronary artery and the septum in up to 15% of patients. So these patients just aren't candidates for this. Uh, RF ablation is new. I won't touch on that much except to say there's an early signal of uh, some increasing LVOT gradient with edema and a high pacemaker rate. But this is a novel therapy called sesame, which again, tries to mimic what surgeons do, but in a patient who can have this under local anesthesia. Again, two catheters are introduced into the ventricle, and this again is new. What we do is we push a wire straight into the heart muscle. And what you can also do is, once the wire is in the heart muscle, put a bend on that wire, and you can freely navigate that wire anywhere you want. You can do circles around the heart. But in this case, what we want to do is we want to define our trajectory that we want to perform the myotomy. And after we define the trajectory, we pull and burn, and then we create a linear laceration down the center line. We're not taking any muscle out. We're relying on the circumferential fibers in the, in the septum to pull and splay uh, that muscle apart. And uh, this is what it looks like in a patient. On the left, we've created that wire loop. We've completely circumscribed uh, how deep we want to go. We've assessed it in multiple forms on, on echo, so we're entirely sure that we're safe. If we think the trajectory is not right, we can redo it. We're not committed up until the time we cut. And then just take a look at uh, one patient example, and you can see how dramatic this effect is. So the top two is a short axis and long axis on CT um, at baseline, and you can see how thick and hypertrophied that septum is. And with a simple myotomy, at the bottom, in the bottom two panels, you can hopefully appreciate that this is a dramatic increase uh, in the LV outflow tract just with a simple uh, myotomy. So the last thing I want to say is that there are dedicated devices coming out for this. Uh, and the first suite of systems is by this company called Transmural Systems that have developed uh, a telltale guide wire and catheter system. And at the core of this is just a dedicated electrosurgery guide wire. Um, and the key feature here is that this is designed with mechanical and electrical properties to perform many of these electrosurgical procedures. Um, and, uh, and, and the whole wire is insulated in exactly the right parts that you would want, want it to be insulated to perform these procedures. And, and we performed the first in human uh, at St. Francis Hospital using this device uh, just a few weeks ago um, in this patient who had risk of coronary obstruction. And so you position the dedicated uh, guides uh, that are shaped to enter the leaflet, and there you see we've electrified the wire, very simply cross the leaflet into an awaiting snare, and then you, you, uh, you capture that leaflet and you snare it. Then you have this dedicated kinker denuda that you see on the top left-hand corner. On the bottom right, you can see on echo that our catheter is directly in front of the left main, so we know that uh, we're protecting it um, exactly in line with the left main stem. And again, so look at the top uh, left-hand corner now at, at my hands. I'm, 
we're just, we've got these dedicated tighteners and it's a barely imperceptible pull. And if you look on fluoroscopy, that just cleanly cuts the leaflet straight down the center line. Look at hemodynamics. There's minimal change to hemodynamics. And you look down at the bottom right on echo and there's this beautiful split down in this native leaflet straight down uh, in front of the left main. The valve is deployed and there's no coronary obstruction. So in summary, Transcatheter electrosurgery uses current through guide wires and catheters to vaporize tissue. It's a nimble tool and it has multiple applications. Transcable is fully percutaneous, ergonomic, and a safe alternative for large bore access. Basilica prevents Conry obstruction, Lampoon prevents LVOT obstruction, Elastic enables lifetime management of tear, and Sesame may relieve outflow obstruction with Hokum and TMVR. And interestingly, all of these have been developed in the last six years. So what will come next in the next six years? Thank you very much.